Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Jeff Tate. We're going to talk today about programmable general purpose I.O. Jeff, general purpose I.O. has been around for a long time. What's changed? Well, nothing much has changed with general purpose I.O. Every chip uh, has it. What, what has changed is it's now easy to make general purpose I.O. programmable. So. With the GPIO pins that you have, you can make them communicate over any protocol. And what's the driver here? Is it that there's so much data coming in and coming from different sources that we need to be able to make sure that it all works together? Uh, yes, yes. But the, the bulk of data in terms of megabytes per second comes typically on chips uh, through SERDES, PCIe, DDR, stuff like that. But those are hard to couple up to. GPIO is still always used because you can use it to talk to pretty much any other chip. But there's a wide variation in the protocols, and the challenge is that it's hard to hardwire every different version of GPIO. With embedded FPGA, you can have a programmable block and connect to any chip speaking any protocol. Let's take a closer look. Right. Jeff, what are we looking at here? We're looking here at a simplistic block diagram of a microcontroller, processor, or SOC. And like with all SOCs, there's a processor of some sort. Here it says a Cortex-M0. You typically have flash and SRAM and ROM. You might have some other accelerators. And then there's a peripheral bus. Typically, people using ARM use APB. And here we're showing typical peripherals with instead of, uh, say, a UART down here, we have embedded FPGA that you can program to control your GPIO. What, why is it so necessary to program this? Well, the alternative is that you, uh, you're, everybody's limited by the number of pins you have, uh, and you can only hardwire so much. So what we hear from customers is they might have a SPI, they might have a UART, they might have uh, some other protocols but they inevitably find some customers where the version of the UART isn't quite the same or they want uh, the SPI a little bit different. And then the customer either has to buy an FPGA to do a conversion or the chip company has to tape out a new version of their chip, which at 60 nanometers, maybe that's not too bad, but at FinFET, that's millions of dollars. So they're looking for a way to be able to connect to any type of customer chip. This also reduces your obsolescence, right? Yes, and it reduces your inventory count. With the old approach, you'd have to, if you did mask spins for customers, you might have several versions of, of things, and inevitably, one customer's orders go down while the other one surges, and they're not quite the same chip, so you've got a problem. And what's happening these days is almost everything's in motion constantly because you're having all this custom silicon, you have all these new developments. You think about automotive, for example, a chip today may be completely useless in, what, five years, even though it's supposed to last for 10 or 15. Yes. When you build a chip today, um, many of these chips are in production for more than 10 years. It's hard to predict the future, so the more flexible the chips are, the easier it is for them to adapt down the road. So how do you actually hook up the EFPGA to the APB bus? So this shows the embedded FPGA with the slave interface control logic integrated inside the programmable logic. You can see here the, the signals that are required. Different buses have different widths. If, if, if it, this has 32 bits, but if your bus is smaller, you can support that as well. So it's a very standardized interface, and this control logic is relatively simple. Now, we don't actually recommend putting the slave interface inside the embedded FPGA. You can hardwire it outside, and we can provide the RTL for that uh, to you for any bus width that's required, and then you can use all of the FPGA for programmable GPIO, so it's easy to hook up to. Does that give you more flexibility by keeping it outside? It allows you to use the lookup tables uh, all for GPIO, and when you hardwire it, it'll be a lot smaller than if it's inside the FPGA. Either one will work. What does this actually look like in, in real life as you start designing these chips. What are you actually doing here? Yes, so when you put in the embedded FPGA, you can program the embedded FPGA, and ours is called eFlex, to implement different types of GPIO protocols using your, your physical GPIO pins. Here we show a bi-directional 32-bit GPIO port connected to the APB bus. So pretty simple, this all fits into a single 4,000 watt FPGA tile.
And here, we're showing a simple UART. It's bidirectional, it's uh, asynchronous, and this is what a lot of people use, but we hear from customers that there are dozens of ways to implement UARTs. So this is another more complicated UART, still fitting in a single 4000 lookup table tile called a 16550. Presumably this was an MSI chip at one point. So uh, there's many, 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 many ways to do UARTs. The key point here is you don't necessarily want to implement the one before or this one. You want to be able to implement any flavor of UART that the customer has and you're able to do that. So we're showing two extremes, and they all connect up to the APB bus. What's the overhead on this in terms of area, in terms of power performance? Yeah, it's, it's bigger, of course, than hardwired. Everything hardwired will always be smaller than an FPGA. But you can't possibly pack into that the same amount of space every flavor of GPIO, and some protocols could exist in the future that don't exist today. So this shows you uh, the number of lookup tables that are required. In, in our process nodes from 28 down to 5 nanometer, our smallest tile is 4,000 lookup tables. So the number of LUTs required by any of these examples is a fraction of what's available in a single tile. A single tile in 16 nanometers takes up one square millimeter. So you can put multiple UARTs or, multi or a spy master at a UART. You can put a combination of GPIOs into a single tile, limited by the number of GPIO pins that you have. And then we show for multiple process nodes. So here we show 40 nanometer, 28, 16, and 7 nanometers. We support other process nodes as well. The frequencies you know, here are hundreds of megahertz, and they get faster with more advanced nodes. So the feedback from customers is that our performance exceeds what their requirements are. But the real key here is that you're able to move any kind of data no matter what, right? Correct. Using GPIO, any chip with a GPIO protocol you can communicate with, even if it's a protocol that is invented in the future after you tape out your chip. And there's a lot of legacy that comes with this too, right? Because now we're dealing with, we're mixing uh, old data centers, new data centers, we're mixing uh, old devices that have been around for years in addition to many of the very, very new ones that are cutting edge. Uh, yes, so this allows you to talk to, to anything. It's like having a multilingual translator uh, available to you at all times around the world. Jeff Tate, as always, thanks for a really interesting conversation. Thanks, Ed.